Can you hear me out there? Good to see you guys this morning. Everybody doing well? Well, why not slap somebody high five, tell them good to see you in the house of God, and then you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, it's so good to be back with you all. I was here in the summer. We had a good time. And then, you know, Pastor Eric said that he needs a Bible nerd to come in. I said, I'm the perfect guy for that. I may look like I'm from The Sopranos or some TV show like that. But uh, I do love the Bible. We geek out at Theosu, and uh, so happy to be here talking with you guys this morning. We love, we love Pastor Eric and Pastor Natalie. They're good friends of ours. And um, last night he took me down to get Italian. I thought, what, do I look Italian? I mean, is that why we're doing this? I'd be going to eat Italian. That, that, what gave it away? Um, But so I figured I have to preach good because we ate good last night. And so we're going to get into the text this morning. Um, How many came ready to learn? How many have like a, how many have like a little geek side to you? Like you're kind of a geek. You don't want people to know, but you're a little bit of a geek. Is anybody like that? How many is not afraid to admit you're just a straight up geek? Like you're just like when people are watching action movies, you're watching Jeopardy or something like that, right? You guys like Jeopardy? I was the guy that was like, if I got a question wrong, I'd want to look up, you know, what, what the right answer was. I'm that guy. I take Jeopardy very personally, and uh, so I am, I am a nerd. So we're going to nerd out today. I'm going to give you a first point. It's going to be more devotional. Then we're going to move into two points. They're kind of academic. Just do me one favor. Stick with me through those because it's going to make sense at the end. Is that okay? Do we have a deal? Yeah. And then when two hours is out, I'll let you out. Is that good? <laughs> What's wrong with two hours? What do you guys got to do? There's no football on there. Nobody watches the Pro Bowl. The Pro Bowl stinks. <laughs> I am a Detroit Lions fan. Woo! I'm from Detroit. Woo! Are you from Detroit? My mother is. Okay, well, that's good enough. <laughs> You're grafted into the family, sister. We took a hard loss last Sunday. I'm still very bitter about it. And so if there's animosity, if there's anger in my sermon, you know why. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, <laughs> this is what it says. Blessed. Someone say blessed. blessed. That's a good way to start off. I'm going to give you what this term means. I mean, this is the drip pan term. How are you doing? I'm blessed. What's going on? I'm blessed. How was your day? It was blessed. We're going to see a little new dimension to this word in just a second. But notice the psalmist ties this word blessed to an individual, or we would call him a disciple today, who has a relationship with the law of the Lord. The blessed person, the blessed man or the blessed woman is an individual whose delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates all the time. There's a love for it, it's a habit in their life. It's not just what they do on Tuesday and again the following Wednesday but it is a constant staple of their life. This individual is like a tree planted by streams of water They yield its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and all that they do prosper. But the wicked are not so. They are like chaff, driven with the wind and blown. Now, this word here, blesses, is is really an important word because it's describing a sense of fruitfulness, describing meaning and purpose to your existence. Now, we all have an existence, right? And if you deny that, come see me after service. We will pray for you. You have an existence, the person next to you has an existence, but there are people that don't have purpose, and they're trying to discover meaning. And the word here, blessed, means a person who exists that is in touch with that meaning and that purpose, because that comes from having a harmonious relationship with the Creator who has revealed Himself to us today in the person of Christ Jesus and through His law. So there's a connection between the Scriptures and having purpose and meaning for why you are here. Now, Sigmund Freud found it very interesting that the modern individual, the modern man or the modern woman, okay, during the modern period, started to experience more neuroses in their life. That means more anxiety, more fear, more worry, more problems, more mental trauma. And he noticed that this was becoming something that was trending up. And he subscribed it to the fact that we had become more modern. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a theologian, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer says that the modern man or the modern woman, the modern society, has come of age. 
Now this word come of age meant that we'd kind of outgrown the Bible. We'd outgrown the scriptures, began to seem to us as a book of fairy tales because the modern mindset was empirical and it was pragmatic. It was about science and reasoning from the enlightenment. And we began to think that this kind of stuff in scripture is just, you know, it's for kids or it's for people when you're going through something, but it's not to be taken literal. It is not something that we should anchor ourselves in as a society. Another, theolo- another um, a philosopher, his name was Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche, he saw this happening and he was, even though he was an atheist, he was concerned that society was drifting away from religion and from God and he said, we have killed God and his problem was, if society kills God, what in the world are we going to anchor ourselves to? And scripture is telling us that the Bible is so important is because the Bible gives to us something that's truthful to anchor ourselves and our existence to because the Bible roots us. And when we're rooted, we have purpose and we know why we exist. And when we don't know that, it's proven to give to us more trauma and a lot more to work through as a people. Now, the word blessed begins in Genesis chapter one. The first time we see it in scripture, it says, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and he blessed them. A blessing of God comes upon the first man and the first woman. But then we know what happens in the Genesis story, right? Something very tragic. There's a fall, and they lose that blessing. But in Genesis chapter 12, God announces once again that there would be a harmonious relationship with the creator and his people, and it's going to come through the lineage of Abraham. It says in chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will dishonor those who uh, uh, curse you. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so with this blessing and the blessing of Abraham comes the identity of the people of God. Society begins to know itself in light of their creator once again. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, as scripture continues to unfold, as the story continues to emerge, we find more about that harmonious relationship with the creator that gives God's people a sense of identity to their existence. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you faithfully obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all the commandments that I command you today, the Lord will set you a high above all the nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of God. So now we see that the blessing of God, which is that harmonious relationship with the creator that gives us meaning and purpose to our existence is associated with the law of God. And that's why the psalmist says, the individual that comes around the word of God, prioritizes scripture, is going to experience the blessing that comes with that, and that is knowing the creator and having meaning and purpose to their existence. And so listen, young people, millennials, (laughs) we aren't as young as we used to be, are we? We're living in a time where the wicked are blown like chaff. We don't know what is up. We don't know what is down. We don't know anymore what our moral bearings are. We have lost as a culture our moral moorings. We have lost our moral orientation. We have lost our sense of identity. And this creates mental disillusionment and psychological problems. That's why, part of the reason why, there are so many issues today mentally in our culture. But what the text is telling us is that when we come into a relationship with scripture by prioritizing it, what happens is, is that we are rooted when everyone else is blown. We are grounded when everyone else is shaken. With the stories and the passages that are in the Bible, we become a people that have a root when everyone around us is rootless and we cannot be shaken. And so there's a call in scripture for disciples. If we're going to be disciples of Jesus, there needs to be a priority that we have on God's word. And listen, Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. This isn't something that's difficult or is going to feel like a burden. It's something that when we do, it blesses us. 
I'll never forget when I was 17 years old, self-confidence problems, you know, my brother was the good-looking one, I was the runt of the litter, things have changed now. <laughs> Couldn't look you in the eye, just depressed, anxious, and when I went to school, I was taking 21 credits, I mean, I'm trying to get through school quick, I don't know why, I'm just in a hurry, and I committed to the Lord that on top of the 21 credits that I was going to take, I was going to spend two hours at night in the library reading scripture, studying it as best as I knew how to study it. I can tell you that in that time, from 9.30 to midnight, every night in the year 2003, my insides began to come alive. It was like ecstasy as I was studying scripture and reading it. I cannot explain to you how it began to untangle the mental problems that I had, the depression, the anxiety, the fear in a way that medication couldn't do it, in a way that whatever couldn't do it, the word of God began to breathe life into my life and the 17-year-old young man that was coming of age began to find his meaning and purpose in God, my creator, and set my course that I'm still walking on to this day. Yeah, it's worth a clap. Sounds pretty good, right? And so we understand, like we sung today, that God's word is a sure foundation. It's something that's going to root and anchor you. Now, here's the thing. Today, we have something <laughs> that I didn't have when I was growing up. TikTok, right? <laughs> good old TikTok. We at Theosu have, have come to know through all the emails and messages that we get, that TikTok, yes, there's some funny stuff on there. Yes, you could get a good chuckle, but there's been some opponents on TikTok that would challenge the notion that scripture is something that we want to base our life. And the generation that's coming up is used to seeing people cherry pick something in a, 16 se a 60 second video that shakes people's faith. And one of the first things that they have, ta have attacked is the scripture as being something that we can stake our lives on. I'm going to show you today that, number one, taking it from someone who's 17 years old on TikTok in 60 seconds is probably not a good place to place your bet, right? But number two, there have been, there have been plenty of studies over the years that have shown us that the scripture is something that we can place our lives upon and that we can place our trust. And I want to show you that in two points today. The first question that we get at Theosu is are the texts, the text itself, isn't that corrupt? How do we know that the Bible that we're holding our, in our hand today, the one that you, Chris, are telling me to read is what we can trust? Now, the most circular way to argue this point would be to tell you what the Bible says about itself. I mean, it does speak of itself like we just read, but I wanna give you more than that this morning for the person that's curious about how the text came together. Now, here's the thing. Here's the challenge. This is the claim that they would make. Number one, they would make four claims about the text being corrupt, specifically the Greek text, which is my, my area of expertise, my specialty. Number one, they'd say this. Well, you know, we don't have any of the original documents penned by the New Testament authors. We call that in the world of text criticism, which we'll talk about in a second, we call that an autograph. We don't have any of the original autographs. Number two, they'd say, and all the copies were made by hand, by scribes, and so we have mistakes in the copies that we have. And then they would say, you know, we've collected over 5,600 New Testament manuscripts, and we've looked at the manuscripts and seen how they varied, and we found that there are over 400,000 differences among them. And then they would even add to that and say, and on top of that, we have no manuscripts from the first century. What we have is the earliest manuscript, so it's um, a, a, man, a, a fragment of the Gospel of John, it's just a fragment. And so they would combine those four things and say, so how can you trust that the Bible that you're holding, that you're telling me to read, the one that brings us into a harmonious relationship with the Lord, that gives us meaning and purpose for our existence, is something that I should even bother reading. Somebody say, uh-oh. No, I'm just joking, there's no uh-oh. <laughs> you can breathe a sigh of relief. Two things real quick before I kind of hash this out as best as I can in the next 25 minutes. Number one, 
This does not mean these claims right here that are made by the very best TikTokers out there in TikToklandia. This does not mean that these are major barriers to our Christianity. These are not, this, this barrier is not as intimidating as it might think. And number two, this doesn't mean that Christianity has been lost forever. And I know on the videos they play like a song that's like intense. Did you know? And it's got like some theme song in there. And after you put it down, you're like, oh my gosh, my faith is ruined. No, 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 it's not like that. I want to give you a little confidence today so that you can walk in a little more boldness about your faith. And be sure that Christianity and the word of God can survive even the greatest test of modernity. So where do the mistakes come from? Like, how did mistakes even start happening in the New Testament manuscripts? Well, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, you don't have to turn there. You can just, I'll reference it. You can write it down for later. You start to see that if an apostle wrote a letter or they used an Emmanuelis, which would be somebody that you talk to, you dictate the letter to that person and they write it for you. Those are how the letters were written. And when a church got a letter, other churches wanted copies of it. I mean, how many would feel left out if another church in Austin got a letter from the Apostle Paul? Wouldn't you want one? Wouldn't you want at least a copy of that? Wouldn't you be like, hey, can you like email that over to us so that we could see what it says? They didn't have email back then. They had copyists who were copying those. And so as early as the first century, letters from the apostles were being copied by the best of scribes. And the best of scribes in making those copies, as good as they were, they began to make mistakes. I mean, if your eyes are moving from one papyri to the next, you can see how you might make an error or you might make a mistake. How many of you have ever like, made a text message and you kind of made mistakes on your text messages, right? I mean, just take spell check off and watch how many mistakes you make. <laughs> I was getting tired of sending text messages that made no sense because it was autocorrect. I took autocorrect off and realized, you know what? Even those mistakes are better than the ones I'm making right now. How many got autocorrect on, right? Yeah, okay, there you go. <laughs> so, so they were making mistakes. I mean, Gutenberg came out with the printing press in 1516, but prior to that, everything was handwritten. So what happened is in all the manuscripts, there began to be these little variations. And so a field emerged, not too long ago, relatively speaking, because as we began to make digs, we found more and more manuscripts. We began to date these manuscripts. This is from the second century, this is from the fourth century, this is from the eighth century, this is from the ninth century. And now today at present, we have 5,600 manuscripts of the New Testament, 5,600, okay, of the New Testament. And when we look at those manuscripts and we compare the differences, this is how many differences we find, 400,000. So you can imagine a 17-year-old going on TikTok and hearing this and thinking, well, there's no way we could possibly have the true New Testament with 5,600 manuscripts and 400,000 changes and, or differences. And so textual critics call these differences variants. Let's all sound smart today and say variants. variants. 400,000 variants. And so these text critics came along. They're versed in Greek, they're versed in Hebrew, and probably two or three other different languages. They're linguists, and they began to make comparisons with these variants. And they began to discover that there are two categories of a variant. This is as deep as we're going to go this morning, so stick with me, okay? There are meaningful variants. That means a meaningful variant would affect how the text reads or what the text actually means. And then there is a viable variant. And a viable variant would say, this has a chance of actually being what was in the original. So you have meaningful, which changes how the text reads, or what it means, and you have viable. This actually has a chance of being in the original. And so they begin to categorize these 400,000 statements. And so you could probably figure out that if a text is meaningful but not viable, it doesn't matter because it wouldn't have been in the original. If a text is viable but doesn't change the meaning, it doesn't matter. And if a text is neither not viable or not meaningful, it doesn't matter. So the only variants that would actually affect where we are today are texts that are, 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 are vari variants that are meaningful and viable. Now that cuts that 400,000 down very significantly to less than 1%. Did you hear what I just said? That less than 1% number, are you ready for it? 1,000. 408 that actually are on the table for us to figure out. So 
Someone say, wow. That's a significant difference, right? So they went and they looked at these 1,408 texts. And as they're working through, the text critics began to do their best to figure out if they could crack or figure out what this actually means. And they found of those 1,408 texts that are both viable as well as meaningful, that only 373 were difficult to figure out. So out of 400,000 variations in manuscripts and their differences, only 373 posed any type of challenge for the text critics to figure out what those texts were doing. That comes to 0.09% of the 400,000 variations that came through some mistake as the copyists made their copies. That is a significantly small number. Let me show you how small that number is. How many of you found that the San Francisco 49ers had a 0.09% chance <laughs> of beating the Kansas City Chiefs are gonna bet on that tomorrow? No. How many would bet on the Kansas City Chiefs if they had 0.09% chance of winning to beat the San Francisco 49ers? The Taylor Swift fan said, I would. <laughs> Small percent. But I know what you're thinking. Yes, but Chris, what about those 0.09% variations? How do we handle those? What are those texts? If you put up Mark chapter 1, verse 41, let me show you what an example of that 0.09% is. In Mark 41, we have an interesting passage. I wrote a book. It's called Greek Word Study. I actually worked with this Greek word. It's interesting because in some translations of the New Testament, you'll see that it says that Jesus was moved with pity and he stretched his hand out and touched him and said, be thou clean. And in some translations, it says that Jesus moved with indignation, stretched out his hands and touched him and said, be thou clean. This would be one of the variations where they can't figure out, was he moved with pity or was he moved with indignation? Now, the interesting thing about that is it's kind of a synonym. Both could actually work. In being moved with pity, you could be indignant. And in being indignant, you could be moved with pity. So it's really not in these either translations, we're not really losing anything. It's just a detail of the text and both details work together. And so out of that 0.09%, they fall into these types of categories, which means this, that in none of the 400,000 variations that we've looked at, we lose anything significant to the message of Christianity. We don't lose the Trinity. We don't lose the sinlessness of Jesus. We don't lose the historicity of the events. We don't lose justification by faith. We don't lose the original sin of mankind. We lose absolutely zero that is crucial and critical to following the faith. That is how well our text has been preserved in spite of any mistake of the copyist. That's worth giving God a clap today. In spite of copyists and their mistakes, the Holy Spirit is working throughout time to lead and guide us to have the Bible that we are holding today. It is a sure foundation. You can trust it, no matter what that 15-year-old on TikTok is telling you. Now, Bart Ehrman, he has been uh, an opponent of text criticism. He studied under like the Michael Jordan of text criticism, a guy named Bruce Metzger. And Bruce Metzger says this, the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. And Bart Ehrman, who is the opponent, says, I think that's true. For the most part, I think that's true. So he concedes this point, and he tells us, for the most part, he's talking about the 0.9%. It doesn't affect anything. What he's saying is that you can trust it. That is a big omission from one of the most well-educated opponents that we have today. So the question is, are the texts corrupt? The answer is, in spite of the variance that we have, the text is not corrupt. We know very confidently today that the Bible we are holding matches that of the New Testament that was being formed at the beginning 
of the canon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sure, clap one more time. Well, the next question that we get at the OSU is, is the Bible authoritative? Like, okay, so, so the manuscripts, they actually work out, checks out. We went through 5,600 5, manuscripts, 400,000 variants. It checks out. We have something that's accurate. But then what about this? Is the Bible authoritative? Can we actually use the Bible as a rule for our lives? Now, think about this for a second. Put yourself in the position of the unchurched millennial or Gen Z generation growing up at this time. At this time, we have human rights, globalization, postmodernism, or what's post postmodernism, which I call metamodernism. We have landed a rover on Mars. How many love the little Mars pictures that you Google? Anybody Google those pictures just to see what's on Mars? Steve, there's like little green men walking around, right? We have self driving cars. We were talking yesterday about Elon. He's trying to do not just a self-driving truck, but a self-driving truck that turns into a boat and drives around. And more than that, we have people talking about moving our civilization to another planet. How about that? I mean, the, the Bahamas don't work anymore. We've got to go somewhere else in the galaxy that's fitting for life. I mean, when I heard them talking about maybe this planet isn't good for our life anymore, maybe we need to send a mothership somewhere else in the galaxy, I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know what? This is going too far. I grew up in a generation where we had DOS. You guys remember DOS on the computer? You put in the hard drive. In fact, before that, you had the floppy drive and little 8-bit game. Like, I'm not ready for new civilizations here on other planets. I know, I'm getting old. So, so in, a, in a Gen Z generation, the Gen Alpha generation who really doesn't know life without AI, without technology, without these advancements, do you think the Bible, to them, is going to sound like the source book for family values? The Bible for them, God's will to be obeyed at all times. And so in this context, the issue is whether the Bible is in any sense prescriptive for faith. Can we say the Bible is prescriptive for faith? And so the single biggest issue today in talking about the word of God that divides traditional historical orthodox churches like this one from progressive liberal churches is whether or not the Bible is infallible or something that is authoritative for life and practice. So there is a seminary out there, Union Seminary, I don't mind calling them out, Union Seminary, that made a statement about the infallibility of the Word of God or whether or not we can use the Bible as something authoritative. And they say this, while divinely inspired, we deny the Bible is inerrant or infallible. In other words, we don't think it's something that you can always trust to live your life by. And they give a reason why. It was written by men over centuries and thus reflects God's truth and human sin and prejudice. In other words, the Bible was written by mostly bigoted people. Now, Michael Byrd, he's a theologian, and myself, we take tremendous issue with the statement. You should take issue with the statement to show you that not a lot of seminaries are veering from scripture. This is how he interprets that statement. I think it's funny, so just have a listen. He says, for those of you that don't really know what they're saying, let me put it in layman's terms. This is what they mean. The Bible has some bits that are generally from God and others that represent human prejudice and bigotry. But thanks to the invention of critical theory, we can identify the divine bits of the Bible and the oppressive bits that are products of capitalist, patriarchal, alt-right evil. No one in church history was able to do this before us because the churches of the previous ages were filled with bigots. So we really are the ones the church has been waiting for since we are the ones the church has been waiting for because we have the privileged perspective to show everyone which bits of the Bible actually come from God. Quite a statement that they're making. And that's something that we have to understand, is that often throughout history, people have approached the Bible like it is a cadaver. They come to it, they remove only the parts that they think are still useful, and they discard the rest of it and want to see it burned up. 
Marcion did this in the early centuries. Marcion took everything Jewish out of the Bible. He flushed the Old Testament basically down the toilet and called that monster God, mean God. We don't need this. Thomas Jefferson did this with the parts of the scripture that talk about miracles. Oh, that's just fictitious. We don't need that. And literally cut those portions out of the Bible. And so throughout history, we have seen people, like my dad says, treat the scriptures like a buffet, like old country buffet. I'm going to take some of the grits, but I'm not going to take some of the vegetables. I'm going to take some of the banana pudding, but I'm not going to take the ice cream. And just taking what they want from it. So the question is, is that how do we approach the text? And I'm here to say, we got to approach it like it's all or nothing. I grew up as a basketball player and a soccer player, and my coach would always say, it is all or nothing. Those of you that are football fans, you empathize with me as a Detroit Lions fan. We have a coach. It is all or nothing. Dan Campbell, he is going for it on fourth down, even if it's the third quarter, and we don't need to be going for it on fourth down, and it's going to blow the game. We are going for it on fourth down. Dan, don't go for it, man. Man, when he went for it on fourth down the third quarter last time, I knew we were done. I sat there on the couch defeated, like, how many more months do I have to wait? <laughs> I prayed the prayer of the souls under the altar. How long, O oh Lord, until you avenge our death? <laughs> People were texting me where I can go get therapy, and believe me, I'm calling those numbers. <laughs> how do we handle a text that is so foreign? How do we handle a text that is so foreign when our generation is calling it into question today? Well, there are three wrong responses. The first wrong response is just to dump the Old Testament in its entirety and say, you know, that was mean God. We don't need the Old Testament. The second wrong response is to interpret the entire thing allegorically and just make it say what we want to and act like literal parts of the text are allegorical. That's a cop-out. And then the third is just to give up the authority of the Bible and use it for pet causes. Say, you know what, the Bible is just a text that whenever we have a socio-political cause, we're just going to take parts of it and add it to our cause because it makes it sound nice and makes it seem like our cause is something that has some sort of ancient association. That's not how we're going to do it. I'm going to give you real quickly before we end today in the next seven minutes and 30 seconds, five ways to approach the text that recognizes its authority and begins to work out some of the problems that people on TikTok might say are wrong with the text. Number one, we need to, not, we need to distinguish between what is prescriptive and what is descriptive. Say this with me, prescriptive and descriptive. Okay, there are texts in the Bible that describe things that the narrator thinks is a really bad idea and is not subscribing you live by those things. Can we get that? Have you ever told a story that you don't sign off on? You know what I'm talking about? You're telling a story about something somebody did in the workplace or at school, and you're like, yeah, probably not a good idea that he did it, but I'm going to tell the story anyway, right? I mean, we get to Judges chapter 11, and here's a guy who's really zealous. His name is Japheth, one of Israel's judges, and he stupidly swears an oath to God that if God helped him to defeat the Ammonites, that when he returns home, he'd kill the first thing that he saw, and he sacrifice, will sacrifice it, and the first thing that he sees happens to be his daughter. How could this be in the Bible? Well, we're not prescribing it. Actually, the narrative point that you see throughout the entirety of Judges is that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. They veered from the law of God. Even the most zealous judges of Israel veered from the law of God, and it was so evil he couldn't even see the evil behind that. So that's not like prescriptive, okay? No matter how mad you get, you can't sacrifice people. How's that? Number two. Many biblical commands are contextual. For instance, not all of them, but many of them in the sense that there was a specific context that are going on, little things. For instance, in Acts chapter 15, they say don't eat food sacrificed to idols, particularly the blood. Well, does that mean that you can't go to Old Country Buffet today and get your favorite medium rare steak? I hope you don't go to Old Country Buffet and get a medium rare steak, but if you decide that's where you wanna go, can you get it? This was contextual and had something to do with how they were sacrificing food unto altars. So there are some things in the text that ask us to move into contextual or find out the context that was going on. And these seem like things that are one-offs in the text that aren't pervasive throughout the text. 
We could talk more about that in a class at some point. Number three, listen, I know we grew up in a time where we were sensitive to issues. And people that have never known a time where we're not sensitive in PC often have problem with the fact that the Bible deals with harsh currency or harsh realities and a lot of what the Bible was written in is not in ideal situations. But I at least appreciate the Bible's honesty. It wasn't going, you know, it's not trying to make it like things were a utopia back then. And so what we have to understand, listen, the Bible speaks to a world that is really messed up and deals with a world that is in moral chaos. I mean, have you ever read the scripture and thought, wow, they were really messed up back then? Yet here's the thing. We often think that when God commands something, instantly things are supposed to get better. But here's the thing. When God commanded something, it wouldn't always clean things up right away. But God's commands were at work in something that we call in theology redemption history. Now, redemption history is a bigger word for how God is working, how God is working throughout history to reconcile the sinful world back to himself. How is God working from the fall of man unto the second coming in the new heavens and the new earth to bring mankind back unto himself? And what the entire story of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus is doing is showing how deeply sinful man is. I mean, I'm teaching a Pentateuch class right now, and the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, are divided into two sections. The first section of the Pentateuch is Genesis 1 to 11. The rest of the Pentateuch is divided in from Genesis 11 to the end of Deuteronomy. Because the first section of the Pentateuch is showing how dark and sinful man is without God and without his laws. You sink into the Tower of Babel. You sink into, uh, into nations that don't want anything to do with God where they value bloodshed and violence. And then God raises up a people that is bringing them through and how to work through times and places where you have this type of brutality. But slowly, as you read the Old Testament, you begin to see that even though commands of God didn't make things better, we are working till we get to Jesus. Amen. And that brings us to the development, that's point four, listening to the text in light of the development of redemption history until we get to the fifth, and that is realizing the unique and final authority of Jesus. What's interesting about the final authority of Jesus is that that brings us to the culmination of redemption history where God now incarnate comes to us and begins to teach us. No longer does he speak by prophets. He now speaks to us through his son. And Matthew frames this right. In the book of Matthew, Jesus goes up onto the Mount of Beatitudes and he sits down and he begins to talk and says, a new commandment I give unto you. The way that Matthew sets this up kind of reflects the Old Testament. Moses goes up to Sinai. Jesus goes up to the Mount of Beatitudes. It's showing that a new and greater Moses is here. A new and greater law is here. And what Jesus does is some portions of the law, he doesn't require. Some portions of the law, he tightens up. Some portions of the law, he modifies. Some portions of the law, he revises. You know why he can do that? Because he's the giver of the law. He's God. And so now we hear the Old Testament through the will, the perfect will of God, and that is Jesus. And in this world, Jesus calls us to follow him. And if you want to be his disciples, he says in John 8, we must obey his word. So following the words of Jesus on all matters of faith and morality and life and living, which includes Paul, is it, Paul breaks down that theology in his letters and it moves through the book of Revelation. Following that, you know what that does? It puts us into harmony with God where we can envision that in following him, his words make life better. How do we know what the new world that God is bringing to come is going to, well, how it's going to look? By being his disciples. Listen, when you follow the commands of Jesus, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. People get a glimpse of what the new world's gonna look like. Yeah. You know what's so interesting is that, I'll show you how this works. My, my, my Old Testament students, their minds were blown when I showed them this. Jesus said, Lamech, Lamech, in a time where the earth is violent says, if you uh, betray me seven times, I will get back on my enemies seven, seven times. He makes this call for violence. Then Jesus comes along and says, forgive your enemies 77 times, times seven. 
What's Jesus saying? That my law, my words, is undoing the violence of the earth that was back then. My commands and my law is taking this earth that is corruptible and that is under sin and is bringing about the new heavens and the new earth. And when you follow the commands of Jesus, sexual ethics, loving your neighbor, giving, doing what he says, your life becomes a reflection of the order and the goodness of the life that is to come in the eschaton. What it says in Psalm chapter 17, 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, and righteousness and righteous all together. What does that mean? Your life takes on meaning. Your existence takes on purpose when you obey the word of God. Take it from a 17-year-old whose life was a mess and gave himself to Scripture. Listen, if you listen to anything that I have to say, don't listen to what a TikToker says. Don't listen to what Travis Kelsey's girlfriend is going to tell you. No matter on this tour or the next tour. And others like her. Don't listen to what a celebrity has to say. Don't listen to what the Paul brothers have to say. There's something more sure, a foundation that has proved the test of time. And if you take everything that I said today and say, I don't know about all that, I challenge you this one thing. Give one hour a day to the Word of God for a month and see how your life is different. And if it's different, then what I'm saying is right. Let's stand to our feet.